technology has created grave threats to life on our planet, and now we need technology to help us address those. Climate change is one example where fossil fuel energy largely created the problem, and now we need clean energy technologies to help us solve it. But we're not actually that good at technological innovation to solve these big problems. We're a whole lot better at creating new gadgets with new functionality that we didn't even know we needed. For example, I recently heard about something called the umbrella drone, which is a drone that's specifically designed to perfectly balance an umbrella. <laughs> but why aren't we better at solving technological problems that really matter? Well, as I've found over the years, I think the answer is that we're missing key knowledge about why technology improves and how to measure it. And so this makes it really difficult to be deliberate about solving those big societal problems. So let me give you an example of this, and what, an example of, of how I um, uh, uh, spoke to a room of energy experts last week, and, and, and why that discussion made me um, think about this problem in this way, namely that we're not as good as we might be in explaining where technological progress comes from. So the question that I asked this room of energy experts was, why do you think solar energy costs have fallen? And specifically, I asked, how much of the cost decline do you think came from government funding for research, and how much for uh, how much came from government incentives to grow markets for this technology. And this is a technology, solar energy, that's often held up as a success story of clean energy innovation. And this room of experts focused on renewable energy, but there was no agreement on the answer. And the answers were all over the place. And here's an example of some of the challenges that we see in measuring technological progress. Let's take the example of the electric car. Everybody knows that the electric car has evolved over time, but how close is it to being an option that can see widespread adoption? And specifically, can we answer the question, how many cars on the road could be replaced by a low-cost electric vehicle today and still meet our daily energy driving needs? And what I found is that people aren't able to answer this question, this very basic question. But if we don't know how to explain technolo technological progress, as we saw from the example of solar energy, and we're not really able to measure it, as we saw in the example of electric cars, then how are we going to know how to invest our time and money best in solving these problems? Well, so this is really what motivated my research. And what I can say now is that I think we can fill these gaps in our knowledge about what drives technological progress and how to measure it. And as a result, we're going to be able to make better decisions about how to solve these problems like climate change and maybe other big problems in the future. So let me go through how we can actually answer these kinds of questions. Let's take solar energy. So solar module costs have fallen by two orders of magnitude over the last 40 years and 90% in the last decade. Why did this happen? This is a technology that's seen faster and more sustained cost improvement than other energy technologies. Where did this come from? To answer this question, what we did in my research group was to break the technology up into all of its cost components. So there are a few different categories of cost components, materials, labor, equipment, and then we want to ask, what changed about this device and what changed about the manufacturing process? So there are a number of different changes, but they can gr be grouped into these three categories, changes to the device physics, changes to the manufacturing process, and changes to the manufacturing scale. Now these, what we're calling low-level mechanisms, these changes act on different components of the device. And some may act on one 
component, and some may act on many more. And the challenge, the real methodological challenge here, was how to model this mathematically to capture the effect of each mechanism on the total cost of solar energy. But we did this, and after doing this, we can say how much these low-level mechanisms mattered. So which one was most important? What we see is that the improvement in conversion efficiency, that's the efficiency with which you're converting the energy and sunlight to electricity, is the single most important mechanism. But also we see that the reasons, the fact, there were many different reasons that the cost came down. There were many different mechanisms that were at play, and I think that may be why this technology has seen more sustained improvement over time. Now that we know what happened to the device and the manufacturing process, we can say something about what the human efforts were and the company strategies that led to this really impressive cost decline, an unprecedented cost decline among energy technologies. And these are what I'm calling the high-level mechanisms. Research and development, that's research by companies as well as government-funded research. Learning by doing, which is the process of getting better at doing something the more you do it and faster at it. And also economies of scale. Now we can answer the original question I asked the room of energy experts, which is how much of the cost decline in solar modules came from government investment in research and how much came from government incentives to grow markets that led to lots of efforts by many different private companies around the world. Roughly 70% of the cost decline came from market expansion policies and the rest from government-funded R&D. So now we can answer this question. How much of the solar cost decline came from government funding? How much from market expansion policies? And this is the right answer. Now let's Take the example of electric cars and ask, okay, how these technologies are improving, but how can we measure progress toward where we want to go, toward our end goal? One of the big barriers to our end goal, to the adoption of electric vehicles, is to meet the range requirements of drivers. Right? So a lot of people are deterred from buying an electric vehicle because they have what's called range anxiety, which is the fear that their car will run out of juice without the possibility to recharge. So is range anxiety justified? Well, it turns out that on the vast majority of days, it's not. And I'm going to show you why and how we can go about answering this question. So I'm going to show you the answer for this one car, the Nissan LEAF, but you can check out other cars um, on this app that my group uh, released uh, last year, but we've actually just updated today to add more models. And as you can see, the Nissan LEAF, it's, it's labeled number one there, and this is a cost, this is a car that costs below, that, that's a, a low cost car. Its costs are well below the average car uh, the average new car sold in the U.S. today. And also, even with today's electricity supply mix, this is a car that can save sub substantial emissions, 30% or more relative to the internal combustion engine, a similar internal combustion engine car. So already today, if you buy this car, you can reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. But can you buy this car? Will it meet your range requirements? And Will it meet the requirements of the entire population in the US? So that's the question we want to answer for this Nissan LEAF. And I'll go through how we can do this. Well, to do this, we actually have to study how people are driving on a second by second basis across the country. That's because depending on how you're driving on a second by second basis, your energy consumption can be very different. The range of your car is not a single number. Depending on how you're driving, it can fluctuate substantially, as I'm showing here, where I'm showing different what are called drive cycles for the same car. So how far your car can go depends on how you're driving as well as a number of other factors. So how do we study an entire US population based on how they're driving on a second by second basis? The data didn't exist to do this when we started out doing the research, and so we developed a model to probabilistically match information in different kinds of data sets to build a data set on the second-by-second -second driving behavior of millions of cars and people across the US, across all of these node road networks. And now we can answer the question, how many cars could be replaced by a Nissan LEAF and still meet the daily energy needs of those drivers without having to recharge? And that number is 87%. 
for that particular car. The number is actually remarkably similar across more sprawling and more dense cities. So even though the likelihood that you own a car and you drive a car is very, could be very different in Houston and New York, there's a certain similarity in how people drive that we discovered through this research, which means that this adoption potential is really quite similar across these cities. So now we can answer the question, what percentage of cars on the road could be replaced by the Nissan LEAF or another similar kind of low-cost electric vehicle like the Ford Focus and their other options and still meet daily energy needs? And that number, as I showed you before, is about 90%. We can do this for thousands of other car models. Looking forward, as batteries improve, you can increase that adoption potential. But what we also see in this research is that there's a small number of high energy days, uh, which are going to be difficult to satisfy. It's going to be difficult to satisfy those needs with an electric vehicle. So one of the things that we're doing is to use the predictive power in our model to develop an app that will allow people to find the, the vehicle that meets their needs. So to, so to match cars to people's needs on a particular day, as well as when they're considering what, what car they may want to buy. So this may help people become more comfortable, those that want to buy an electric vehicle, give them the information, empower them with the information to perhaps get over their range anxiety. And, you know, there are other lessons that come from this research as well. So it, in the solar energy example, uh, with this model of, of why technologies, per, why this particular technology improves and where that progress comes from, uh, we're also able to uh, provide advice on, to engineers as well as companies and government uh, policymakers as to where, what strategies might be most effective to drive the cost down further. And as I mentioned in the example of the electric vehicle, now that we can measure progress against people's needs, we can also provide some insight on how to uh, develop this technology further. Both of these are technologies that could reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and there are many other technologies that, that could, could help with that as well, where we can apply this approach. So what does all of this mean? Well, as, I, as I've shown through these two examples, we actually can measure progress toward technological progress toward these broad societal goals. And we can explain where it comes from. This will help us make better decisions about how to invest our time and money in developing technologies that will help us so solve problems like climate change and maybe other problems as well in the future. So this doesn't have to be guesswork. As an engineer, as a company, as a government a policymaker, as a private individual, uh, this doesn't have to be guesswork. We can, we can actually say something about how to uh, choose technologies and develop technologies to get where we want to go. We're really good at developing technologies that we don't need. Now, the thought I'd like to leave you with is that now let's use a science-based, data-driven approach to develop technologies, to make technologies, to adopt technologies, to solve the big problems that matter most. Thank you. Thank you.